Fiona McFarlane, welcome to Booktopia. Thank you. Now, in your book, a woman wakes in the night and thinks that there's a tiger in her room. Why? Why a tiger? Sure, well, the tiger really was where I started with The Night Guest, actually. It was um, really based on a conversation I had with a friend of mine who was doing some research on Victorian children's literature. And we were talking about how all of these nursery rhymes and cautionary tales had these wild animals in them. They had elephants and lions and crocodiles and particularly tigers. And we're just talking about that in the context of really of the British Empire and this idea that these terrifying colonial animals were infiltrating the Victorian nursery and being used to terrify children into behaving. And so I started to think about, you know, what would happen if I took a character who had some kind of um, oblique involvement with, with the British Empire, with kind of the end of the British Empire, and was also at the end of her life. And what would happen if I put a nursery tiger into her house? So the tiger represents partly, does it, her fear of dementia, which she is suffering from, and we should give her name, Ruth. Um, So is the tiger partly Ruth's dementia? Yeah, I think it is. I mean, I think, I don't want the tiger to be one specific thing that it's nailed down to. It's definitely a figure of fear and the uncertain, but it's also a figure of the extraordinary because Ruth sees it as something exciting and urgent and she misses that in her older age and is excited to find it again. So tell us a little bit more about Ruth as a woman. What kind of temperament does she have? What kind of personality and what kind of life has she lived? Sure, Ruth is, she's 75. She grew up as the child of missionaries in Fiji, uh, missionary doctors. She came to Sydney as a young woman after a sort of disastrous non-event of a a non-love affair. fell in love with Harry, her husband, got married, had two children, was an elocution teacher, um, had a very self-consciously ordinary life in Sydney. Uh, When Harry, her husband, retired, they moved to their holiday home on the south coast, and then Harry died, Mm -hmm. and Ruth found herself a widow alone on on the coast, and found herself not wanting to move back to Sydney, and Uh, Her sons both live overseas. So she's a very private person. She's a sensible sort of person. She's um, even tempered. She she likes to please people. She likes to be ordinary, but at the same time clings to this sort of feeling that her childhood in Fiji was somehow extraordinary. And she, she sort of trusts in the ordinariness of her life, which is why when this tiger shows up, He's, he's sort of particularly worrying and exciting. Well, he would, he would worry anybody, no matter how sensible or not sensible they were. Um, in, in writing about Ruth and her, her dementia, or the sort of approaching of that and the fear of that, were you basing that on something in personal experience with elderly relatives of your own? Both my grandmothers did suffer from dementia. And it's funny, people ask me that a lot. And... It it seems so obvious that that is part of why I wrote this book, but it's not actually something I was consciously aware of when I started. It's definitely the case that once I realized what I was doing, I wanted to write really respectfully and unsentimentally about dementia, um, particularly older women. But my experience of dementia was really that neither of my grandmother's symptoms were the same as each other, that it's a very idiosyncratic condition and it looks different in in everybody. And Ruth is not based on my grandmother's at all. And I think there is this sort of sense I have that both of them lived these long, wonderful, interesting lives and their dementia was really just a small part at, at the end of it, an important part, but a small part certainly doesn't sum them up. And I think that's true of Ruth as well. And that's part of the, the tension in the book is between this life she's lived and then this new condition she finds herself. Well, and there's another uh, dimension, a very um, important dimension to this tension, as you put it, in the book, which is that a stranger arrives in her life, a woman called Frida, who um, has assigned herself the role of being Ruth's carer. Tell us about Frida. <laughs> Frida is quite a magnificent individual. She arrives at Ruth's back door uh, the morning after Ruth hears the tiger in her house. She um, she's a large woman. She changes her hair colour all the time. She's a woman of many moods. She's a very efficient carer in many ways, but she really very quickly 
infiltrates the household and comes to rule it in many ways. So what are we supposed to think of Frida's motives and of Frida as a real life entity as opposed to being a figment of Ruth's imagination? A lot of people do say to me, is, is even Frida real? Is, you know, is anybody real? <laughs> um, and it's always funny as an author to be asked to interpret your own book in, in that sort of concrete way. Um, the way I wrote it, she is real. Uh, she is a woman who exists and who comes into Ruth's life and, um, and really manipulates what she finds there. And her motives, I think it's fairly obvious pretty early on, are not necessarily entirely sound um but at the same time i think she is she's a complicated woman who actually finds what she set out to do to be uh, more complex than she thought it would be mm. one of the things that i think you do particularly well in the book is um the way you capture that particular dynamic between aging parents and their adult children particularly adult children who are far away in the case of um ruth's sons and the way children speak to their parents uh, when they suspect that dementia is happening, which is so patronising. <laughs> how how did you get the tone of the book to be so right on that and, and to have this kind of playful irony and, and magic to it? Oh, thank you. Um, I'm, not, I'm not really sure. I mean, I feel like I should say, just as the book wasn't based on my grandmother's, it certainly wasn't based on the behaviour of any of my parents or aunts and uncles about their, their mothers. So it wasn't, it wasn't from experience. I think, though, I mean, I lived overseas myself for 10 years, and obviously my parents are younger and healthy and fine. Um, but, you know, we spent a lot of time talking on the phone and on Skype, and I was friends with a lot of expats who were doing the same thing. And there is a sort of different understanding of how family love and care and responsibility is configured when somebody is you know thousands and thousands of miles away and so it's just really conscious I have many friends who have been overseas for a long time have great jobs and families and their parents are starting to get ill and it's just that question of you know do you come home and when and how and under what conditions and what's best for everybody it's, it is really complicated and I think I mean the sons in the book people always say to me who are these men what are they doing you know I just want to yell at them get on a plane and come home right now but I think which you know I want people to feel that way but at the same time people's lives are, are busy and um and full and it's tricky it's very tricky um, I mentioned a certain kind of magic about the book, and obviously that's that's there from the beginning, given the presence of a tiger. Um, can you talk a little bit about symbolism and the sort of mixture of symbolism and religion that you've kind of used as a sort of underpinning for the book and for this tale as a kind of myth? Sure, yeah, it's definitely, there are definitely sort of um, mythological or allegorical elements to the story, to sort of Ruth, who's had this, what she sees as this transcendent childhood when she's been brought up in this missionary family, very aware of the presence of God and, you know, of the sublime. And then when she moves to Sydney and she stops believing and she um, undertakes this very ordinary life. And so when the tiger reappears, then obviously it is a sort of transcendent presence that's taking her back to her childhood. I don't, um, in terms of writing, I'm not sure that I don't know if anyone does sit there and think, ah, this is the symbol I'm now going to inject into what I'm doing. Um, but I think I was always conscious the whole time because this is what I love to read. I love to read books in which there's so much more going on under the surface. I'm interested in the connections between things, particularly if they're unusual. And I'm interested in them if they just sort of arrive, you know, what seems like accidentally. So I wanted to explore sort of all, all the connections between you know, the tiger as this sort of literary figure out of children's literature. I mean, in some ways he's Shere Khan from the Jungle Book and it's the tiger who came to tea and all these wonderful tigers all, th all throughout children's literature. I was interested in Blake's tiger too, obviously. I mean, there are so many tigers in literature. Recently there are, many of which appeared after I'd started writing my book. <laughs> but, yeah, so I was interested in the tiger as a literary figure. I was interested in the tiger as a projection of Ruth's own sort of fear and longing and her own condition as well. I was interested in what someone like Frida could do with something like a tiger, how she could use the tiger as a mm. symbol and manipulate him. So I was definitely trying to be conscious of those things. 
Fiona, in the end, though, I was left wondering whether, in a way, you were saying that maybe there is less to fear about dementia than perhaps we think, and that maybe there is something... Wonderful is too strong a word, but that the fantasy that goes with dementia may not be all bad. I think that's true. I think, I think that some people experience dementia in ways that are actually calming and beautiful and there have been breakthroughs in treatment of dementia in that way. There's this incredible virtual reality game being developed right now which will put dementia sufferers in a forest and, and, and it sounds amazing. I think for a lot of other people dementia is experienced as, as terror and paranoia. So in many ways it's hard to say, you know, this is what dementia is, this one thing, and it's going to actually it's going to be all right, don't worry. But it's tricky to talk about it without talking about the end of the book, but it is important to me that the character of Ruth's fear changes throughout the book, and that by the time we reach the end of Ruth's story, she's not afraid anymore. And that to me, a lot of people tell me this is a really dark book, but to me that is really, really important, and it's what I was working towards as I was writing it. Thank you very much, Fiona McFarlane. Thank you.